Welcome to Gateway's weekly service. We are so glad that you are here. We pray that this message inspires you, it encourages you, and that God speaks to you in new ways. Now, on with the message. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We're so grateful to you for who you are and what you've done for us, what you do for us every day. We're so grateful. Lord, today as we look to your word, I'm asking you, dear Holy Spirit, please be the teacher today. Show us the things we need to see and help us to grow. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, you go ahead and be seated for a few moments. Worship team, thank you so much. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 6. I started a new teaching series last week called Suit Up. It was a bit crazy in here because we had... Um, I think we were 10, 10 children being dedicated, so it was a very, very busy Sunday. Um, but we started a series called Suit Up, and I'm talking about the armor of God. And so Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 says this. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, I want to say therefore. Therefore. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So Paul here mentioned six pieces of armor. Slightly strange number because God is a seven kind of God. Seven is the number of divinity. It's the number of perfection. Actually, there is a seventh piece that Paul doesn't specifically mention the weapon that went with it, but it would be the lance or the spear. Roman soldiers also had a spear. Probably the one guarding him at that moment didn't because he wasn't in a battle pose. He was in a protection pose. But they also had a spear, which they would throw as the enemy would come in. All the soldiers would throw the spear at the same time. And, and from a distance, it would kill or certainly badly wound the enemy. And so the idea was that you'd keep them from even getting close to you. So you wouldn't need your breastplate and helmet and sword and and different things because you dealt with them at a different distance. And that's the next verse, praying. It would say praying. Praying Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So there are really seven pieces of armor, but Paul specifically mentioned six with, you know, um, examples of what the soldier was wearing. So we're going to look at those six. In this series. And in some ways, this language is a little unusual in the New Testament. Wouldn't be out of place in the Old Testament at all because the Old Testament was a battlefield filled account. In the New Testament, you don't see David killing Goliath, you don't see Samson killing the Philistines, Moses on the mountain with his hands raised, and Joshua in the valley fighting the enemy. So the question is has Satan gone away? No. No. Has he gone to sleep? Sadly, no. Has he surrendered mankind and left for other places? No, no, no. no. Is he on Mars? No. No, not at all. He's just changed his tactics. And his battle has gone from flesh and blood to the spirit realm. The battle has moved into the spiritual realm. And whether you know it or not, his troops are marching against your family, against your faith, against your finances, against your fire, against your friends, against the promises and prophecies spoken over your life. And just because you can't see your enemy doesn't mean that you're under attack. And so Paul is getting them ready ready for a fight. But it isn't a fight that comes in the physical or the natural world. This is a spiritual battle. So he says, put on the armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles or the strategies of the enemy that have been dispatched with your name on it. And so the focus of this teaching specifically is how the enemy will try to get you out of faith and into condemnation. But the Bible says, having done all to stand. I want to say stand. Stand. Too many of us have sat down. We've sat down because we've eliminated our own selves from winning the battle we're in because of our feelings of unworthiness, guilt, 
shame, condemnation. We don't pray enough. We don't read the Bible enough. We're not holy enough. We're not as holy as the people on the worship team. The worship team aren't as holy as the people on the altar team. The altar team aren't as holy as the people on the car park team. And if you're questioning that logic, you join the car park team for a week or two and you will find what goes on out there, especially when there's big events on. Oh, my days. The hoo-hahs in the car park. Then we come and, oh, I love you, Jesus. We need to love him just as much in the car park as we do in the sanctuary. But we've eliminated ourselves. But I'm telling you, we're not talking about a flesh and blood battle here. We're talking about positioning yourself to fight the good fight of faith. Or you could say, where your faith does the fighting. And every one of us experiences battles. I'm not a prophet to tell you, you've either just come out of a spiritual battle, you're in a spiritual battle, or you're about to go into one. And if we aren't prepared ahead of time, we will react in carnal ways or natural ways to spiritual attacks. We'll fuss, we'll fight, we'll work harder, take, take extra medicine, we'll defend ourselves, avenge ourselves, we'll run around getting angry and annoyed and use the horn instead of our prayer language. And, and we use natural ways to try and overcome spiritual battles without the armor of God on. And so Paul tells us to put on all this equipment for battle, but he doesn't tell us to march. He doesn't tell us to fight. In fact, he says, put on the whole armor, leave nothing off so that you can stand. The Bible says to stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has made you free. We wear armor, but not to fight. Jesus fought for us, but to stand. So you don't get pushed back. You don't get pushed back into old way of living. You don't get pushed into sitting down when you need to stand in faith. You don't get pushed back from your love walk, pushed back from the authority which you've been given in Christ Jesus into an old way of living, an old way of thinking. Jesus has won the battle, but we stand strong in his might and in his power. And so today we're going to talk about specifically the mighty breastplate of righteousness. Now, I want to say this. The focus of today's teaching isn't about righteous living, holy living. However, I do want to say this. The breastplate of righteousness and the fact that we wear that breastplate, and we'll find out the significance of it in a minute, it doesn't exempt you or me from right living. The fact that we are saved by grace doesn't mean we can just do what we want and, and say a sorry Lord later. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sin... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I remember when I was in Bible school, uh, someone, I was, in the, I was in the car and they were speeding a little bit. And someone joked, said, oh, you're speeding. And the person just in fun said, oh, I'll 1 John 1, 9 it later. <laughs> and yet they were joking. But haven't we all been, well, I'll watch it now, but I'll 1 John 1, 9 it later. No, 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 no. The righteousness of God in Christ doesn't exempt us from righteous living. It just does, does mean this, though. The gap between you and God has been bridged, and you are living in the finished work of Jesus while you develop the characteristics, the personality, and the mindset of Jesus through the metamorphosis described in Romans chapter 12 where you put off the old man and you put on the new man. You have been made righteous. But we live out of that righteousness. And this is where the Bible talks about the fruits of righteousness. In fact, specifically in the context of giving, when in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, the Bible talks about multiplying the fruit of your righteousness. You can't multiply or increase your righteousness, but you can increase the manifestation of it, the fruits of it. And so when we think of fruits, we think in terms of being holy and and and. Righteous living, and that's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. Do you realize this? Jesus' entire public ministry was the fruit of his righteousness. All those people he healed, all those things he did, all those words he spoke, those that he raised from the dead, the feeding of the 5,000. You're watching a man who knew that he had the right to stand in the presence of God and unashamedly stood at Lazarus' tomb and said, God, I'm only praying this so they'll know it's you that does the work. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus' entire public ministry was the fruit of his righteousness. So what is righteousness? Well, here's a simple definition, but it's a good one. Righteousness is the ability to stand in God's presence without the sense of guilt or shame or inferiority. Let me say it again. Righteousness is the ability to stand in God's presence without the sense of guilt or shame or inferiority. Man, what incredible things we could do if we were aware of our righteousness. How fearless would we be in the presence of bad reports or 
negative things going on around. So let me ask you a question. In this room, how many of you are righteous? Raise your hand if you're righteous. Okay. <laughs> some of you. Some of you want to put your hand up, but you're worried you could get struck by lightning. <laughs> we'll talk about this in a minute. <laughs> oh, church, I love you. This is going to be good today. So I want to read an excerpt from a book by Rick Renner. I, I forget the name of the book. Um, oh, I don't actually. Dress to Kill. Hallelujah. It's a book about the armor of God, and he describes the breastplate in a better way than I ever could. So let me just take a couple of minutes and read from Rick Renner's book, Dress to Kill. He says this, the breastplate was the shiniest, most beautiful, and most glamorous piece of weaponry that the Roman soldier possessed. <laughs> When people walked up to a Roman soldier, they certainly didn't notice his loin belt first. They didn't notice his shoes or his sword. And as conspicuous as the soldier's helmet was, the piece of armor that immediately caught the attention of onlookers was his large, shiny, gorgeous breastplate. It's the first thing you'd notice. The breastplate began at the top of his neck, went all the way down to his knees, and it was composed of two different pieces of metal, one on the front and one on the back. And the two pieces of metal were held together by solid brass rings on top of the shoulders. Now, quite often, these larger metal sheets were covered in the front of the back with small scale-like pieces of metal, similar to the scales of the fish. So they kind of, you know, tuck over each other. This was the heaviest piece of weaponry that the Roman soldier wore. At times, it, it weighed in excess of 40 pounds. The Bible tells us that Goliath's breastplate, it weighed 125 pounds approximately. So the breastplate was extremely elaborate and beautiful. It was made of either bronze or brass, but usually it was brass. And the more Roman soldiers wore their breastplates, as they walked and marched, something incredible would begin to happen. When you rub two shiny pieces of metal against each other for a long time, they began to add a luster to each other. These pieces of metal may have started out shiny, but this new luster makes them shine even brighter. And this is exactly what happened when the Roman soldier walked around with his breastplate on. As they would walk and move, those scales would rub against each other, the smaller pieces of brass, and they would cause this luster, this bright, shining ray almost to come out of them. And so it sparkles when it's out in the sun. And so when the sun would hit their breastplate, it would be dazzling. It'd be blinding. Some of you, when you were in school, you would take a ruler and you would direct the sunlight into the teacher's eye or maybe other naughty people, not you, but other people's children. And you'd, Samson's shocked that children even do this. Do Samson. There are naughty children out there that do this. And they'll get the light off their watch or off their ruler and they'll try and shine it in the teacher's eye because it's aggravating and it's blinding. But if you ever had that, when the sun reflects off of something and these soldiers would line up by the thousands and they'd wear these breastplates that had rubbed together and had become bright, shining brass. And they would position themselves in such a way that the sun would reflect off of those breastplates. And, and they'd all turn at once and literally dazzle. I mean, blind, temporarily blind the enemy with the brilliance of that breastplate. Paul said, that breastplate that you wear, that thing that dazzles and blinds the enemy, that thing that causes him to see nothing but the brightness of the sun is, a, is righteousness. You are wearing righteousness around your heart like that soldier is wearing a breastplate around his breast. There's protection in that breastplate of righteousness. And so the righteousness, your righteousness, that you have received as a gift from Jesus is stunning. Perhaps it's the most dazzling thing you or I could ever possess. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 6, our righteousness shines like the noonday sun. So I want to talk for a minute about how we understand this righteousness and how the Holy Spirit helps us. And, and in a moment, I'm going to re-ask the question, how many of you are righteous? And my hope is that the other hands will go up. Because Paul said this. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you can stand. And can I be really honest with you for a minute? You know, I love you, right? But those of you that didn't raise your hand, you don't have your armor on. Because if you can't confidently say, I'm righteous then you haven't put that piece of armor on. I know why you haven't put it on. You haven't put it on because you look at yourself and you think, I don't do righteous things. I, I've made mistakes. I've gotten things wrong. I don't pray enough. I don't read my Bible enough. I don't come to church. I, I, I cannot bring myself to say I'm righteous. 
It's because we think of righteousness as a reward that we earn rather than a gift that we receive. Can I tell you something, my friend? By grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the just shall live by faith. So I remember a number of years ago when I moved to Eastern Europe. In fact, it was over 30 years ago. I was given a, a box full of cassettes. Some of you uh, remember that ages me. For millennials, just Google it, what a cassette is. And you'll find I don't have time to describe. But I was given a box of cassettes. And it was a teaching by Andrew Womack called the, um, the Christian Survival Kit. Anyone else had those cassettes? Not cassettes. Yeah, all right, showing off. He just had it downloaded to a chip in his ear. So there's 17 in there. The one that really stood out to me is a message that he preached. And it was called, um, it was about this, about how the Holy Spirit helps us. And I want to talk about that today. So this is Andrew Womack's message. I'll, I'll put a little bit of my own in it, but man, it'll help you. John chapter 16 and verse 5 says this. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. That's understandable. Jesus is leaving. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Quick question. Who is doing the talking? Jesus. Who is the helper he's talking about? The Holy Spirit. That's right. Oh, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, we have read this incorrectly for years. Let me tell you how we read this. Even though our eyes might glance over the right words, this is how we morph it in our thinking. Let me tell you how we read it. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sins, with an S at the end, of unrighteousness and of their judgment. That's how we think it in our heads. When he has come, he will convict the world of sins, of unrighteousness, and of judgment. And so we have seen this as the soul winning work of the Holy Spirit alone, getting people saved. But the word used for world here is the Greek word cosmos. It means the universe or the world, the inhabitants of the world. It's the same word used in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It means everyone. This is a ministry of the Holy Spirit to everyone. And the first thing the Bible says, or Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do, is convict us of sin. Everyone say sin. sin. Doesn't say sins. Says sin. What sin? He goes on to say, of sin because you don't believe in me. The sin that is the issue in our life isn't all the sins that we commit. It's the sin of rejecting the Lord Jesus. The Bible says if you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ and with your mouth you confess him as Savior you will be saved. It's not the confession of all of our individual sins that causes us to be saved. Or else if you were 30 when you got saved, how on earth are you? I struggle to remember the things I did this week. <laughs> and I like to clean my slate on a Monday. If you had got born again when you were 30, that would be an incredibly long prayer time for you, listing all of your sins for the last 32 years. No, the issue is this. Do you believe or do you not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because by grace you're saved through faith. And so when you and I commit an act of sin, which we still do, and we're still capable of sinning, hence the glorious verse that says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts me. He reminds me, John, don't forget you believe in Jesus. Your relationship with God isn't based on your sins not about what you got right and what you got wrong. Don't forget, John, that you believe in Jesus. You are not a sinner anymore. You are a child of God. You used to be a sinner. Now you're saved by grace. And he convicts me. He reminds me, John, you believe in me. You believe in me. You're a child of God. Number one, he comes to convict us or to remind us that the issue is sin, not sins. I'm not saying sins are okay. I'm not saying we should just accept them. No, we stand against those things. And our goal is to be as like Jesus as possible. But your relationship with God isn't based on your holiness. It's based on Jesus' holiness. 
And the moment we add to the cross, we take away from the cross. And so he comes, number one, to convict you of sin. Don't forget you believe in Jesus. When you are beating yourself up, when your own heart is condemning you, the Holy Spirit will come and say, don't forget, it's all about Jesus. John, it's all about Jesus. The next conviction he brings is of righteousness. We think this says unrighteousness. We picture the Holy Spirit standing there saying, see, you got this wrong. That's not the only thing you got wrong. You get that wrong too. And you're, you, how can you call yourself a Christian one? You're so unrighteous. You're so unworthy. You've got all these things wrong. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of righteousness. Jesus said, because I go to my Father. Hallelujah. Now, if you think for a minute of this little section here being the cross death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus was talking to them on this side of the cross. And he said, the Holy Spirit will, not yet, he will convict you of righteousness because I go to my Father. Now, Jesus knew he wasn't going to his Father until he'd first been to the cross, taken the keys of death and hell, raised again from the dead, presented his blood before the Father, showed himself alive for 40 days, and then was ascended up on high. Jesus said, I'm going to my Father. I will have given you the gift of righteousness, and the Holy Spirit will convict you, not of your unrighteousness on this side of the cross, but of your righteousness on this side. My friend, unrighteousness is not a helpful weapon. It's like jumping out of a parachute with a tank tied to you. Boom, you're going to float like a stone. It's not a blessing. Righteousness is the gift of God. Righteousness saves you. Righteousness redeems you. And so the Holy Spirit comes and reminds you not of all the things you've done wrong, although he does at times. Where's my Bible? He does at times use the word and show you things in you that you haven't seen. And he washes you and cleanses you through the word. But the condemnation you feel, the Bible says, is from your own heart. You beat yourself up. God lifts yourself up. Let me say it again. You beat up. He lifts up. Condemnation tells you everything that's wrong. Conviction tells you everything that you are in Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit comes and reminds you, John, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A few verses later, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I don't have righteousness like I have a jacket. I am righteous because Jesus redeemed my nature. I'm a new creation. The old me was unrighteous. The new me is righteous. Let me ask you, how many in here are righteous? A few more hands. We're getting there. Put your armor on, my brother. Put your armor on, my sister. The third thing he comes to convict you of is judgment. Now, this one's terrifying when you read it wrong. Oh, the judgment. We all dread the judgment seat of Christ. Don't really know which one is our one. The judgment seat or the great white throne or the, the trumpet or a scroll or a vial. or a, We don't know, but it just sounds awful. And that dreaded moment we fear when we're told that all our sins will be laid out for us like a scroll. Which is going to be very difficult because the Bible says your sins and iniquities I remember no more. But maybe just for you because you're exceptionally bad <laughs> and particularly wicked. If you even make it to heaven, let's be honest, you're going to be the, the, the worst Christian to ever actually make it to heaven. Because judgment's coming your way. And the Holy Spirit helpfully reminds you, you miserable thing. <laughs> you shouldn't even be at that church. I'm amazed they let you join. I'm amazed you made it through Indy Gateway. What a miracle. That's the first miracle you, you got through Indy Gateway. They let you in? Wow. There's judgment coming. Your, no, it doesn't say of your judgment. It says of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Who is the prince of this world? Satan. The accuser of the brethren. And the Holy Spirit comes to remind you, not only, John, don't forget you believe in Jesus. Don't forget. John... I want to remind you, you're righteous. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And don't forget, you're going through these problems now. You're facing these temptations now. You're having these issues now. But the 
the prince of this world is judged. It's not going to be this way forever. It's not going to last forever. There's a lake of fire waiting for him. But there's a place at the right hand of the Father waiting for you. Jesus is preparing a home for you that where he is, you will be also. Satan's not going there, John. Don't forget, you believe in Jesus. I've made you righteous. And you are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. And the Holy Spirit comes to remind you of your righteousness. The Bible says there is a lake of fire, but not for you. It's for the devil and for hell. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. The devil who deceived them. One of the biggest deceptions that he sends our way is that we're a Christian. All right. I'll give you that one. You go to church. Okay, I'll give you that. You go into heaven. But by the way, you are a miserable, unrighteous thing all the way getting there. Don't expect your prayers to be answered. Don't expect God to bless you. Don't expect God to help you. Because let's be honest, you're awful. This is what the devil throws away. And so Jesus said, hey, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper. He will convict you of sin because you believe in me. He'll convict you of righteousness because I've been to the cross. I've gone to the Father. He'll remind you that the prince of this world is judged. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling low, when you are discouraged, when you're condemning yourself, when you're pointing out your prayerlessness to your own self, the Holy Spirit will come in. And if you have an ear to hear what he's saying to the church, he will lift you right back up. So that your righteousness shines like the morning sun. And in fact, we learned from this illustration, when the devil comes your way, don't talk about how good you are. Just position yourself in such a way that the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ shines off of your heart and blinds him. That all he can see is the righteousness of God in Christ. The prince of this world is judged. Let me read two verses of scripture to you in closing. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 says this. I think I might have quoted this during communion. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15 says this. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And then he adds, by the way, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Aren't you glad that God doesn't remember the things that we've done? Because we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And the righteousness of Jesus shines like the morning sun. Come on, let's stand up on our feet. Can I ask you a question? If you are righteous, raise your hand. Come on. In fact, raise them both. We have been made the righteousness of God. It's not our works. It is a gift of God. Thank the Lord. Come on. Let's just take a minute and thank Him for His gift. Jesus, thank You so much for Your kindness, for Your cross, for Your mercy. Lord, thank You that You didn't just leave us as unrighteous sinners, but forgave us anyway. Lord, You changed our nature. You placed your spirit within us. You changed everything about us. And we are now born again, children of the Most High God. Thank you that I have the right to come boldly before the throne of grace. I have the right to stand in your presence without fear and condemnation. Your gift is so great. Your righteousness is so powerful. My nature has been so changed by you. And I am so incredibly grateful. Jesus, I love you. I love you. And help me. In fact, Lord, forgive me for the times that when Satan has come my way and when problems have come my way, I've looked to my own self or I've assessed my own ability and I haven't looked to you and I haven't thought about you. Holy Spirit, please freshly convict me every time I'm tempted to go down the road of me to take me down the road of Jesus. In you I live, in you I move, and in you I have my being. And Lord, I pray that my life would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. And that people will be able to receive of you because of what what you've done in me and in us. And Jesus, we give you thanks for this. In your mighty, mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can the redeemed of the Lord say so? Jesus, thank you. 
for everything you've done and everything you are. Now, I'm going to ask two things as we close. Please stay with me just a minute longer. Don't do the end service shuffle just yet. Two things. One, I'm going to ask the altar team to go ahead and come. And if you need prayer in any area of your life, please don't walk out of here with unmet needs. We've just discovered we can come right into the presence of God. And you have a Father that loves you and shines over you. In fact, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that you are the apple of God's eye. I love that verse. He that touches you touches the apple of my eye, the Lord says. If you're in here and you say, John, I, I haven't believed in Jesus. I don't know if I'm a... I, everything you're talking about, I, I, it, it sounds wonderful. I, I'd love to receive that. I'd love to be the kind of person you're describing, but I don't know if I am. Well, the Bible says this, today is the day of salvation. And when you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, what we've talked about today, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his gift to you. And when you then call on his name as your savior, the Bible says you'll be saved. You're not saved because of all the things you do and all the things you get right or wrong. You're saved because of what you believe. And Jesus comes into your heart and he changes you. And you'll find you have a different nature. The things you used to desire, you don't desire anymore. He changes you. So if you're in here and you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you've never surrendered your life to him, then I want to pray with you as soon as this service ends. Or maybe you're here and you are a Christian, but you're away from the Lord. You know the terminology. We call it backslidden. You say, I want to come back home. Then there's people ready to stand here and pray with you today. So I'm going to ask one more thing. If you're here today and you brought someone with you and you're not sure if they're a Christian or you don't know where their relationship is with God, maybe they're away from the Lord, then do the work of an evangelist and ask them, do you want to go up and be prayed for? And if they do, come with them. Bring them. Don't let them come up here alone. You come with them and introduce them to someone that's going to introduce them to Jesus. So if you need prayer, as soon as this service ends, I want you to come straight up for salvation rededication, or any other area of your life. But church, I love you. Thank you so, so, so much for coming today. Don't forget, tomorrow we're praying at 6.30, praying for revival, praying for the move of God, praying for Liverpool. And then I just got to tell you, on Thursday, my honey's coming home. So I can't wait. Five more sleeps. So anyway, God bless you. I love you. Have a great rest of the day. Come get prayed for. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's message at Gateway. We were so glad to be able to share it with you. If you would like to find out more about what is going on at Gateway or when our weekly services are, you can visit our website at www.igateway.org.uk. Thank you so much for joining us and we can't wait to see you next time.